Welcome to another episode of Legal Watch. I'm your host, Megan Redshaw, and today we are going to be talking about sudden infant death syndrome and a new theory developed by Dr. Ron Brown. Dr. Brown has written over a dozen research articles published on PubMed investigating the novel causes of disease and their prevention through dietary modification. He recently published a theory linking sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS, to pulmonary edema from salt. Dr. Brown, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Megan. Thanks for uh, interviewing me. So can you explain a little bit about your new theory connecting sodium to SIDS? Well, first of all, let's define SIDS, exactly what we're talking about. Sudden infant death syndrome is the death of an otherwise healthy infant, usually below one year, one year of age, that remains unexplained even after a thorough investigation, um, often involving an autopsy and also an investi investigation of the sleeping environment. So my article contributes a new theory to the cause of SIDS. So there has been no established cause of SIDS for decades. My article used the grounded theory method to review evidence from the research literature linking SIDS to sodium toxicity. Now, sodium toxicity is the toxic effect of too much sodium in your body, either from an acute massive ingestion all at once of too much salt, but more commonly from an overload, an accumulating overload of chronic intake, of large amounts of sodium, uh, sodium chloride, over a long time. And I wanna make a distinction between sodium that occurs naturally in food and sodium chloride, which we add to food. They're not the same. Sodium as it naturally occurs in food can satisfy your need for sodium requirements, which is only as little as 500 milligrams a day, provided that it's coming from those natural sources, such as whole foods, whole, whole uh, green plants, um, nuts, seeds, grains, fruits. Sodium chloride though, is a different situation. The body's not really designed to handle sodium chloride. And this is especially true for infants. Infants don't have the kidney function to help excrete large amounts of sodium chloride. So these were the sensitizing concepts as we call them that alerted me to look for evidence linking sodium intake with SIDS. I had done some other research linking sodium toxicity to severe acute respiratory dis uh, distress, which is COVID-19, for example. And in my research that I published on COVID-19 for severe hospitalized cases, I found that sodium intake, at least theoretically, was linked to pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema means fluid retention in the lungs. When the lungs fill up with water or fluid, in this case, fluid from retained water from sodium, it blocks the air sacs so that oxygen can't get into the blood and the patient suffocates. Literally, the patient is drowning in fluid in their own lungs. And this is commonly seen in pneumonia. Pneumonia is a severe acute respiratory uh, illness. So it's very much related to COVID-19. So then I thought, after I published all that, how does this relate to SIDS? And sure enough, I found a very similar mechanism. Um, so I found that sodium toxicity in infants appears to cause a similar respiratory distress response known as pulmonary edema, which is suffocation caused by excess of fluid retained in the lungs. So how does salt cause lungs to fill with fluid in infants. Between the ages of two and four months, those are the peak, that's the peak age for SIDS in infants. Infants, as I already mentioned, lack the kidney development to regulate large amounts of salt intake. That explains why breast milk is low in sodium, while cow milk is much higher in sodium, and also explains why infants should be fed breast milk uh, uh, especially before the age of six months, instead of cow milk. 
it's much more suited. And there, of course, be, as you probably know, there are so many other factors in breast milk that are necessary for proper development of the infant. But the fact that it's low in sodium is very, very important. If infants are fed cow milk during that age, especially two to four months, along with other conventional foods that are high in salt, the sodium toxicity can occur. And excessive sodium chloride causes fluid retention in the body, which is known as hypervolemia. And hypervo a hypervolemic state has been found in infants who have died from SIDS. So fluid containing sodium chloride leaks out of the arteries in the lungs. So the arteries go into the lungs with deliver blood and the sodium chloride in the blood leaks out of the arteries and into the alveolar, those, those air sacs. It goes right through the membrane. And as a result of that, it pulls water along with it. And it's very difficult for the lungs to get that water back out. It has to be literally pumped out and takes energy, ATP, in the sodium potassium pump to pump that out again. And it takes a very long time. So you could see that somebody that's having a sudden influx of this pulmonary edema could be in severe acute respiratory distress. So you mentioned a few sources of sodium exposure for infants two to four months, and you mentioned cow's milk. Is this also a concern with, say, for parents who feed formula? Formula is typically a pre-powdered mix that you put in water. Do you see any differentiation between formula-fed babies and, and babies fed breast? You know, I, I looked into that, and I and I'm suspicious. And all I can I can only speculate uh, speculate about that because infant formulas try to replicate breast milk as much as possible, and that would include lowering sodium intake. However, we know that in general, processed foods, and that's what an infant formula is, tend to be higher in sodium just for preservative purposes. So I'm a bit suspicious about infant formulas, and I think there are more research needs to be done into that to specifically examine the sodium level. So uh, that but you raised a really good point because that, that needs to be examined further. What about exposure through vaccinations? Uh, as you know, there are additives and adjuvants that are added to vaccines. The vaccines are processed in large part by the kidneys. So with the vaccines that have, say, sodium chloride added to them, could this be a potential exposure during that two to four month age window that you mentioned that could put an infant at a higher risk of SIDS? Well, actually, the answer is yes. Although I came upon that part of the evidence later as I was writing the uh, peer-reviewed article, and I didn't have a chance to get it into the peer-reviewed published article. However, the CDC noted that infants, as you say, that are vaccinated during the period of two to four months, that coincides with the SIDS peak period. And the CDC noted that, and they investigated it, but they could not find a causative mechanism from vaccines to, ex to explain uh, a correlation between SIDS deaths and the vaccine. However, my, my uh, theory suggests, provides a new insight into a mechanism that could explain that, that connection, if there is one. And so that would require uh, further, further studies. Most people, as you said, don't realize that vaccines, vaccines often contain saline, which is sodium chloride in water, and it's used as a diluent. In other words, to dilute the vaccine. As a matter of fact, the Pfizer vaccine for COVID-19 is uh, shipped and processed by the pharmacist with, uh, with saline to, to prepare an injection. Now, although the amount of sodium chloride involved in the vaccine itself is rather small, nevertheless, you're not eating the sodium chloride. It's being injected directly into your body, and it's feasible that if a person, an individual, either an adult or an infant, already has a high level of sodium toxi toxicity, that extra amount could be enough to exacerbate the condition and bring on these types of symptoms. And no, some of the symptoms, yeah. let me just say one more thing, would include things like thrombosis, myocarditis. All of these conditions have been related to sodium chloride. And I have other articles published uh, detailing the evidence about that. So this is very feasible that these uh, factors could all be connected in the problem of SIDS.
Now, in your trail site news article, because you did write about this on the website, it, you mentioned a triple risk model. Can you explain what that is? Right. The triple risk model is a model that explains a theoretical or hypothetical cause of SIDS. It has to meet three criteria. One, there has to be a link to the critical development of the infant. And I've already mentioned that. The infants, two to four months uh, during the, the peak of SIDS, have undeveloped kidney function. So that's a critical development issue. And they can't efficiently regulate high sodium levels. So that's, that's the first criteria of the triple risk model. The second one is they have to be exposed to certain stressors. Well, in this case, the pathophysiological stress is from sodium toxicity due to exposure to high dietary sodium intake. It damages the microvascular endothelial barrier and alveolar epithelial barrier causing pulmonary edema in the lungs. So I do some technical terms at you right there, but that's exactly what's happening. It's going to out through the vascular membrane in through the air sac membrane. So that's the exposure to stressors. So that's the second criteria for the triple risk model. And the third one is there has to be an increased susceptibility. And here I point out that the, there are social, social determinants that increase an infant's likelihood of harm from SIDS due to high sodium intake. And those two things are, the two of them are lower socioeconomic status. We know that people with lower SES, as it's said, is as it's called, generally eat higher levels of sodium chloride. They generally eat more highly processed foods, which are generally more available and cheaper. And that would apply to infants as well. And also heavier salt intake occurs during cold seasons. During the winter time, SIDS increases along with other respiratory infections and, and uh, problems. And this is related to the fact that we eat heavier in the winter time for heat purposes generally. And along with that comes a lot more sodium chloride. The sodium chloride level in our diets is, is too high. It's, it's the sodium, amount of sodium of an adult is around 3,500 or more milligrams a day. It should be down to no more than 2,300 for purposes of preventing disease, but a minimum level is 1,500 would be even better. And as I previously mentioned, no sodium chloride at all is probably best, provided you're getting sufficient amount of natural sodium in whole foods. And that only accounts for about 500 milligrams of sodium. And of course, we're talking about infants. So is there like an ideal range that an infant should be within? Obviously, if a, if a mother is breastfeeding her infant, she doesn't really need to calculate right. or, or worry about the sodium as it pertains to what her infant is ingesting. But for other people who maybe aren't breastfeeding, is there an ideal range? I would say the ideal range is zero. For an infant below six months, they should be, if you're going to, if you're going to feed them a formula, make sure that the sodium intake is is as low. Well, it should match the actual sodium intake of breast milk. Let's put it there. There's an answer to your question, right? So no more than that. Why would you want to provide more of a nutrient to an infant than is higher in breast milk? Breast milk is already perfectly matched to their needs. So that's the answer to your question. That's the amount that you should be feeding them. That's a good answer. And my next question is, do you have, is there any other clinical support that could back up your theory or what's the next step now that you've developed this theory? Well, that's a good point. This is just a theory, but it's based upon evidence. That's the whole idea of the grounded theory method. We gather evidence from other research findings and we compare them and we link them together into themes and to, and till it synthesizes into an explanation for whatever the research problem is that we're investigating. So the next step stage of the research is to develop hypotheses based upon the theory. So the theory states, this is what's probably happening. The hypothesis says, well, if that's true, then when we look for this, we should find that or whatever. In other words, it refers back to the theory. And so it's a way of testing how true the theory actually is. But before we even get to that level, first, we have to construct the theory. And that's what I've done. So I've constructed this grounded theory. And after decades of searching for the cause and prevention of SIDS, hopefully this new theory will offer new insights into 
uh, research of SIDS, because how many people are really uh, looking into the problem of sodium toxicity in SIDS? Uh, I didn't find anybody else who was really looking into that stream in particular in the research literature. So this is opening up a new avenue for further research. Well, I think it's a very interesting theory. I'm glad that you shared it with us. I'm glad to see it in PubMed. I'm assuming that the next step of this process will be published on Trial Site News so that everybody can read it. Sure. I have to go out and raise the funds to get the clinical team together to do some clinical trial studies, uh, perhaps using uh, mothers you know, and infants and investigating in two groups how much sodium they're they're intaking and how is that correlated to the incidence of SIDS. So, you know, that directly related to sodium intake, that's what's lacking in the research literature. If we get research like that, we're definitely on the track to solving this problem. Well, I definitely think it's an area that we need to look at. And I hope that you will come back on Legal Watch after you have completed or even are in the middle of the next step to tell us what you are seeing. Because I think this is an issue that obviously affects every single parent. We should be doing more research on this. And I can only thank you for taking it upon yourself to actually look into the connection between sodium chloride, sodium intake, and SIDS. Thank you very much, Megan. Nice talking with you. Thank you.